an original MCM production. Good afternoon, everyone. John Gerda is a Milwaukee-born writer and historian who has been studying his hometown since 1972. He is the author of 21 books on subjects ranging from life insurance to Frank Lloyd Wright and from heavy industries to historic cemeteries. The Making of Milwaukee was one of John Gerda's most ambitious efforts with 450 pages, more than 500 illustrations and photographs, and a cast of thousands, it is the first feature-length history of our community published since 1948. Milwaukee Public Television premiered an Emmy Award-winning documentary series based on the book in 2006. And John recently told me there are plans to update that series for rebroadcast next fall. This fall, Historic Milwaukee released John's newest and biggest book, Milwaukee City of Neighborhoods. This book, over 460 pages, is the most comprehensive account of grassroots Milwaukee ever published, based on a popular series of posters published by the City of Milwaukee in the 1980s. And my guess is some of you have those posters hanging in your homes. The book features 37 neighborhoods that emerged before World War II. And the book also features 11 new neighborhood posters by artist Jan Kotowitz, and I think John will talk about that. The book has a current rating of 4.67 out of five stars on Goodreads, so that's a very positive review. With John's monthly opinion piece in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel's Crossroads section and his co-starring role in Just Around the Corner with John McGivern, John Gerda has become a household name around the state of Wisconsin. John holds a BA in English from Boston College and an MA in Cultural Geography from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. John is also an eight-time winner of the Wisconsin Historical Society's Award of Merit. John serves on the Frank P. Zeidler Awards Committee and the Milwaukee Park Commission. Not one to jump from board to board or stretch himself too thin, John invests in the organizations he joins. After 21 years, he stepped down from the board of the Basilica a year or two ago. But to my great pleasure, he continues to serve on the board of the Milwaukee Public Library Trustees. And he has done so since 1993 and will be completing his 23rd year in January. John serves currently as our president as, and is one of our most illustrious patrons and researchers. Please join me in welcoming my friend and board chair, John Gerda. Thank you, Policy at 4.30. <laughs> Today is board day. Uh, and I've been on that board since 93 uh, through Paula's administration and Kate's before hers. It's been a, a pleasure, one of my favorite the favorite public institution in Milwaukee. Uh, it's nice to see so many old friends here. One of the advantages of being in town for a while is you develop uh, a lot of networks. And I think I've known someone at almost every table here. And I'm on my fall book tour. I was on a podium with uh, Marquette Law School about three weeks ago. And the keynote was a guy who had just written History of the American Public Library. He was on his book tour, who had taken him from Los Angeles to Florida to New York to Chicago. Mine goes from Thienesville to South Milwaukee. So, so <laughs> a, a little more circumscribed, but a lot less wear and tear on the system. So I want to talk about neighborhoods in the time I have. And look at the screen here. Milwaukee has always been a city of sides, north, south, east, and west. And each has its own unique assortment of neighborhoods. 
I'm going to trace the development of two of those signs of town, east and west. The others will have to wait for another time, or you can read the books, which is for sale down here in the southeast corner. It helps to think of Milwaukee's development as kind of a slow, extended Big Bang. The city center was kind of the focus of a burst of energy back in the 1830s that radiates out into the adjoining counties and still has an impact 175 years after people began to settle here for European backgrounds. And I'll talk about two of our sides, the east and the west. North and south will wait for another time. The east side is the most sharply defined of Milwaukee's sides, bordered by the river and the lake. It's pretty obvious what the borders of the east side are. Interestingly, in a city that has 100 square miles, the east side has only four of those square miles. So 4% of Milwaukee's land area, which may be surprising considering how large a role the east side plays in the city's kind of cultural life and has for a very long time. The dominant pattern in the east side is wealth along the lake and the working class settlement along the riverside. And those two threads are really preserved in the landscape. But it's embodied in three different neighborhoods. You've got Lower East Side and Upper East Side divided by North Avenue and North Point in between them. East of the river, this is the Lower East Side poster done by Jan Katowitz. In pioneer days, people were already dividing themselves up according to ethnicity and income. And the nucleus of the affluent lakeside corridor was Yankee Hill, the neighborhood just north and east of Cathedral Square. This was where the Yankees lived, the frontier elite. And this home was fairly typical. This is the George Miller home. He was a partner of a firm called Miller, Mack, and Fairchild, later known as Foley and Lardner, and married Timothy Appleton Chapman's daughter. This was a wedding present from the founder of Chapman's department store to his daughter and son-in-law still in use as the headquarters of Milwaukee's Junior League. So this is typical of the kind of housing you had on Yankee Hill. So it was uniformly Anglo-Saxon, and their churches were Anglo-Protestant as well. This is Emanuel Presbyterian, goes back to 1837 downtown, moved here in the 1870s, and it was joined on Yankee Hill by churches like St. Paul's Episcopalian, All Saints Episcopalian, First Unitarian, and Summerfield Methodist. The skyline of Yankee Hill is a thicket of steeples. One thing you do not find in Yankee Hill is Lutherans, Catholics, or Jews. Those were the immigrant base. They belonged somewhere else in other neighborhoods. These were the Anglo-American, the Protestant base. So as Yankee Hill was filled to capacity, those wealthy settlers kept on moving up the lakeshore and Prospect Avenue with its great prospect or view of the lake was the next step out and that was lined with some of the finest Victorian mansions in the entire Midwest. They would retain their ties to employment downtown, some commuted by carriage back to Northwestern Mutual with their downtown law firms. Some even walked to the town club, which was where the CVS Pharmacy is now on Farwell and Brady, where they could play tennis or ice skate in season. And this is typical of the homes that once lined the lake bluff along Prospect. This is Charles Ray's home, long gone, but he was a banker and a grain merchant. So this is the lakeshore thread. Something quite different was happening along the riverside. You had a dam below what's now the North Avenue Bridge put there back in 1843 by Byron Kilborn, the West Side's founder, as power for a canal that was never built. He had a habit of making enemies and that canal was finished uh, about a mile and a quarter, and that was all she wrote. He always had a plan B, so it was no longer a canal uh, water course, but it became what was known as the water power. It was Milwaukee's first industrial district. So you have this dependable source of hydraulic power, and it was lined in time, and this is uh, still there today. Anyone know what it is? It's filled in. This is Commerce Street. So what now is some of the, the priciest condos in Milwaukee was once a water course lined with, among other industries, tanneries. This was Milwaukee's tannery district, and before that it was flour mills. So you have railroad shops, the Swiss brewery locates there in 1870, and that water power was lined with large industries. They needed workers, and who came out to take those jobs but Poles along the riverside. This is Pulaski Street, that's Wolski's Saloon on the left side of the photograph. How many of you have closed Wolski's? 
<laughs> a few of you have been up there as well. Uh, this was a filled-in ravine, and this was typical of the very dense and pretty much entry-level housing that was built by Polish immigrants who walked to work in jobs along the industrial waterfront of what is now Commerce Street. They also began a church. You think of the stereotype as always, the south side's entirely Polish, and that's where all the Poles are. The second church built by Poles in Milwaukee is actually St. Hedwig's up on Humboldt and Brady. It goes back to 1871. It was the hub of an urban village. A densely built neighborhoods, chicken in the backyard, cows and pigs as well. And you had grocery stores providing a commerce for People from the neighborhood, this is the Wichita Husky, this is not the coach's relatives. <laughs> he was there not too far from Brady Street. And these are the typical houses along Van Buren, Polish flats that were built in stages. It began with a single cottage and jacked it up, built a second unit beneath it. Imagine the contrast here along Milwaukee's east side. Along Brady, you have low-income Poles living above the river with large families and small homes. St. Hedwig's clock, keeping time for the entire neighborhood. Just a few blocks away along Prospect Avenue, you have the splendor of Victorian mansions with artworks on the walls maintained by domestic staff, some of whom may have been recruited from the Polish neighborhood. So that is the contrast of the east side. That defines pretty much the character of the east side historically, and that pattern certainly lingers in the present. The contrast persisted as the east side continued to, to develop. The wealthier Milwaukeeans along the lakefront uh, kept on going. They made a hard right turn at Lafayette and founded what is now the North Point neighborhood. They found a couple old landmarks waiting for them. One was the water tower, goes back to 1873. All that's in there is a cast iron standpipe four feet in diameter that was built to relieve pressure from the water mains as the water would pump in surges. So the contrast, swell, contract, swell. So it's a very simple mechanical means of equalizing pressure on the water main and is now the east side's most cherished symbol. You also have right across the street, St. Mary's Hospital, begins at St. James downtown, moves up to North Avenue back in 1858 and was Wisconsin's first public hospital. So you've got some landmarks there that were joined by the residents. The settlement began of uh, that wealthy a thread back in the late 1800s, and these were fine homes. This is Gus Taft's home on Terrace Avenue, just uh, south of North Avenue. Here's the front yard. Here's the backyard. Imagine what it took to mow that before you had Toros and Snappers, you know, on the, <laughs> on the market. And right next door, this building still stands. It is now apartments. And right next door to the Gus Taft's home was the home of Lloyd Raymond Smith, whose father was A.O. Smith who ran the largest automobile frame uh, plant in the entire world. This goes back to 1923. This, of course, is Villa Terrace, which is the Museum of the Decorative Arts and the only one of those old North Point mansions that is open to the public. So above North Point and west of the river was the Upper East Side. The contrast softened somewhat, but they still retained their force. And again, there were landmarks that preceded urban development. One was the North Point Lighthouse, goes back to 1855 on that site. You think a lake park is always having been wooded? It was farms, and it took a long time for those trees to rise to uh, the point where they were equal to the lighthouse. They actually had to raise that lighthouse from its foundation to clear the trees as they got taller. Lake Park itself was purchased back in 1890. That was a destination for Milwaukeeans from all neighborhoods. Wonder what those hats weigh. So strong necks for those Victorian women. And as that settlement continued, you have families like the E-Lines building homes up on Lake Drive, still there, some of the finest in the entire state of Wisconsin. Along the river, you had that contrast continuing as the settlement developed north of North Avenue. Along the river, you have large factories like National Brake, which made locomotive brakes, railroads spewing smoke along what's now the Oak Leaf Bike Trail. The houses tended to be on somewhat the modest side, kind of in between river and lake. This is Locust Street. And a lot of duplexes, uh, larger homes on smaller lots, but maintaining kind of a connection with the working class as well. And today, those contrasts are still here. In 2015 on Kenwood Boulevard, there are 15 houses per block near the lake and 30 near the river. The Upper East Side's average lot width is 30 feet in the southwest corner and 60 feet in the northeast. 
So still the pattern in the landscape of 2015. There were institutions that draw from both sides, including the Oriental Theater, built back in 1927. And curiously, the middle ground between river and lake was open for a number of years before residential settlement began there. And 1894, it became the home of Milwaukee's first primitive golf course. A couple of Milwaukeeans had gone down to Chicago, got bitten by the golf bug. They came back and laid out a golf course in the area bordered today by Locust and Hartford between Downer and Oakland. Can you picture that? UWM, basically. And they used red balls to avoid unfindable eyes during the winter months. They were, the sport was called pasture pool in some circles. Tomato cans served as cups on the shaggy greens and they used bandanas tied to fishing poles instead of flags. This was the origin of the Milwaukee Country Club. This is where it begins on the east side. And in time, they move out to River Hills back in 1911 when development pressures mounted and those pressures were supplied by, among other things, some large educational institutions. This is Milwaukee Downer College, which was planted on the corner of Hartford and Downer back in 1899, a pioneer in women's education. It was joined a, 10 years later by the Milwaukee State, Wisconsin State Teachers College. You all recognize this building. This is now Mitchell Hall. And it was the Teachers College, but it became in 1956 Old Main for UWM when that institution got started. UWM began with 4,481 students and quickly ramped up to 25,000. Ever since, it has had a profound influence on the East Side's housing market, its cultural life, and its parking. That takes us to the upper limits of Milwaukee's east side, and the contrast continued. East Milwaukee incorporates in 1900, north of Edgewood Avenue. That's now Shorewood, a name that was adopted back in 1917. And to this day, compare Wilson Drive, the apartments there with the mansions on Lake Drive, and those contrasts still persist. And on up to Whitefish Bay, 1892, Fox Point, 1926, and Mequon in 1957. You can trace that thread of affluent settlement in one unbroken line from Ozaukee County all the way back down to Yankee Hill. So history tends to cast a shadow. Once things get, it's going in a certain direction, they certainly persist. On the west side, a rather more complicated neighborhood, the contrasts are similar there, but in some ways they're even starker. On the east side, there was at least a transition zone between river and lake, between wealthy and working class. On the west side, they practically shared a lot line. That's especially true in the neighborhood called Avenues West. And that area's development actually begins back in the Third Ward, which was the Irish settlement in early Milwaukee, a filled-in swamp that was developed back in the mid-1800s, as you can see from the holy overalls here, this was not a wealthy community. It's called the Bloody Third for a high proportion of saloons and a rather high arrest rate as well. But they moved west after an 1892 fire especially and created a settlement called Torrey Hill, which now rests under the Marquette Interchange. I call that the biggest gravestone in Milwaukee because it's right on top of that old neighborhood. And Jesu Church goes back to 1891. They built the present church in 1894. You think of that as being the campus church for Marquette. It was a parish church for the Irish neighborhood of Torrey Hill that was right behind it. Had an active school whose alumni included Pat O'Brien, the movie actor, uh, Bill O'Donnell, the county executive back in the 1970s. The men worked in the Menominee Valley and the women worked as domestics for the rather large homes on Wisconsin Avenue. Marquette University actually begins on State Street back in 1881 on the hill around the safety building, that's why they're called the Hilltoppers. And they moved to Wisconsin Avenue, then Grand Avenue back in 1907. This is Johnston Hall, and you can see the foundations on the right-hand side of Jesu. It was literally in the shadow of Jesu. And this was the entire campus of Marquette for the first number of years that Marquette got going. Right behind Johnston Hall, you have the rather modest homes of Torrey Hill, first off the Irish, then Eastern Europeans, ranging from Serbs to Croats to Slovenes. Something quite different was happening on the other side of the street. This is a club you may recognize. This is the Wisconsin Club. This was Alexander Mitchell's home on 9th, just across from the Central Library. 
And he was the richest guy in Wisconsin. And as he grew his home, they actually changed the name of the street out in front of him from Spring Street to Grand Avenue back in 1876. That's where all the grand houses were. And his home set the tone for the development going west. Here is Mrs. Plankenton out for a ride in her carriage. It finally turned out. And here's the inside of her home. Her husband was John, who ran one of the largest meatpacking plants in Milwaukee. And fine furniture, really big lamps, and all kinds of artwork on, on the walls. And just down the street, of course, the Pabst Mansion. It was back to 1893, and that was the showplace of Western Grand Avenue. And the building on the right-hand side there was actually the pavilion of the Pabst Brewery during the World's Fair of Chicago back in 1893. Inside was a gold-plated replica of the Pabst Brewery. And they dismantled it and reassembled it on the site of the Pabst Mansion when that fair was over. That wealthy pattern persisted as development moved west. <clears throat> you have a neighborhood called Merrill Park west of 27th Street between 27th and 35th. There was a Merrill. He worked for Alexander Mitchell. His name was Sherburn S. <clears throat> he was a general manager of the Milwaukee Road, and it was his decision to build a pretty much a, a gentleman's estate out there around 30th. This was his home, standing at what's now the site of the cafeteria at Marquette High School. <clears throat> Rather changed from that area, from that era. And he decided to build the Milwaukee Road Shops, and he ran as general manager back in 1880 in the Menominee Valley, just west of what's now 35th Street. This became the neighborhoods and one of Milwaukee's largest employers, made all the rolling stock, all the locomotives for a national railroad. It was so closely bound to the neighborhood, they actually built a footbridge connecting Merrill Park with the jobs down there along the Menominee Valley. I thank you very much. <coughs> And this is Merrill Park, the heart of Merrill Park. And development there begins back around 1880 and continues. It shows some vacant lots there. And the focal point, as was so often the case, was the place of worship. This was St. Rose Church, built back in 1888. And the roster of charter members there was like the Dublin phone book. The roster certainly was Irish, but the area was quite diverse as well. There were Germans as well, like the Zeidler family, Frank and Carl, both mayors, were raised in Merrill Park. So that was an intensely working class area, and you can follow that pattern as you go farther west to Milwaukee's smallest and most uniquely named neighborhood, Pigsville, down in the Menominee Valley itself, beneath the, what's now the Wisconsin Avenue Viaduct. Blue Mound Road, this is actually Blue Mound before there was commerce there, going down to the Menominee River. And this was the main traveled road out of town, went right through Pigsville until the Grand Avenue Viaduct was built back in 1911. Kind of put a roof over Pigsville and allowed it to develop in peace and quiet. And the reason the name, uh, where it came from, was as the neighborhood developed, there was a pig farm on the west bank of the river, run by a family named Price. So Pig's Town appears in print way back in 1894 and that gets kind of transformed to Pigsville over the years. Someone actually invented a George Pig, P-I-G-G, -G, to give the neighborhood a little bit more cachet. You know, than, uh, they, after a number of years of snickering. And the Menominee River was right next door, a very unpredictable neighbor, and flooding was frequent. You had to take the rowboat instead of the family car out if you wanted to get around town. And the major ethnic group here was people from the Slavic nations of Eastern Europe, especially Slovaks. And this is a Sokol, kind of a Turner Society for Valley Slovaks. And you can keep following that working class thread out through West Milwaukee and into West Allis. Same pattern, going way back to Torrey Hill around Marquette University. The wealthy thread kept on moving west as well. Grand Avenue remained the lifeline. The Concordia neighborhood was a particular stronghold of affluence. It took its name from a German Lutheran college that was put there back in 1883. Those students were hardly affluent. Most of them were German-speaking farm boys from around the Midwest. Here we're having a pillow fight in the dorms, kind of breaking up the monotony of life in the dorms. But their college was in the center of a real stronghold of affluence. Grand Avenue was lined with fine homes, and Highland Boulevard was kind of a competitor, sort of a bookend for Grand Avenue. And this was the stretch from 27th to 35th. 
the Papp sons both build homes on Highland Boulevard. You have the father down there on 20th, and the boys build fine homes of their own up around 30th. Look at the carriage houses in the back of these photographs. They're bigger than most single-family homes in the surrounding areas. And it wasn't just Millers, or it wasn't just Paps. You had Millers, Usingers, Key Capers, Manigolds, Filters. Highland was so lined with wealthy Germans that at one time it was called Sauerkraut Boulevard. You also had less typical neighbors, among them Dan Hone, who lived on Kilburn Avenue for virtually all of his term as mayor. He was outvoted in his district uh, uniformly. He was a socialist Daniel in a den of Republicans there on Milwaukee's west side. Movement continued to the west and north into Washington Heights, which was developed largely between 1910 and 1930. Washington Boulevard was the neighborhood spine, in line with some of the finest homes of the early 20th century in Milwaukee. And the main institution there was St. Sebastian's that opened back in 1929. And St. Seb's, you can see the scale of the church here kind of reflects what's going on in the surrounding neighborhood. Just north was Sherman Park, another middle to upper middle income neighborhood developed in the teens and 20s. And one of its show places was Grant Boulevard, settled after the first zoning ordinances were passed, so much more orderly, much more uniform than the rather chaotic land use patterns in the older part of town. That movement continued out through Washington Highlands, Wauwatosa, Elm Grove, Brookfield. Again, you have a chain of relatively affluent settlements that span 15 miles from Alexander Mitchell's home on 9th all the way out to Western Brookfield. Same pattern in the landscape going way back for well over 100 years. With more time this afternoon, we could explore the stories of north side neighborhoods like Lindsay Heights and Amani, or go down to the south side, explore Bayview and Tippecanoe. There is lots more to talk about, but that in a nutshell is the story of grassroots Milwaukee. It's the story of how our ancestors settled in different parts of the city, created dozens of different neighborhoods, and yet were part of the life of the larger community. It's on the neighborhood level that you see most clearly the unity and diversity that makes urban life so interesting and where you see the historical patterns that shape life in Milwaukee as we know it today. Milwaukee is most definitely a city of neighborhoods. I encourage you to discover their riches for yourselves. Liz said we have time for questions. Yeah, Ted. Uh, Ted's question was, does the book include a schematic of streetcar lines? It does not. That is an entirely different book, and it's called TM, which has been in print since the 1970s. Great book. It's as thick as this one and weighs almost as much, and it shows every route that was ever put on the landscape in Milwaukee. First streetcars and then bus, now a collector's item. So there's a lot of, a lot of good sources on streetcars. This is not one of them. We have lots of pictures of streetcars. Yes, sir. When did electricity start? Uh, back in the 1890s. And there were homes, especially on the upper end of the income scale. And you can still see fixtures that were wired for both gas and electricity. They're kind of hybrid fixtures. So they're kind of hedging their bets. Uh, so if, if this newfangled thing didn't take off, you know, they could always go back to gas. So 1890s, and by the 1920s, Milwaukee was virtually all sections of the town pretty well electrified. And it became part of the, the fabric, the infrastructure of the entire city. Uh, what was the impact of the freeways on the, the city itself? It was positive in that it moved people through the heart of town. It was profoundly negative in moving tens of thousands of tax-paying citizens of Milwaukee and some of the areas in the south side, north side as well, uh, around St. Stanislaus Church right there on 5th and Mitchell. You know, you stand in front of the church, you're looking down onto the freeway. That's a really densely settled neighborhood. And you think of the swath of homes that were, were vaporized for the construction of that freeway. So it's kind of a sort of yin-yang. Uh, Vancouver, BC, you know, they seem to do without freeways. You know, it's a, a city certainly of good size, uh, but they, they manage to survive the congestion uh, that comes from not having freeways. Uh, in Milwaukee's case, uh, we move traffic, but uh, let us not delude ourselves that it has not had a social cost. 
Well, look at Park West. How long has it taken for that to come back? You know, 30 years, and it's still in the process of redevelopment. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the, the question was, did the wealthy and working class send their kids to the same schools? If you were really wealthy, you sent your kids to the German English Academy. That was the forerunner of what's now the University School of Milwaukee. And that had a number of locations around Milwaukee, but that was, if, if you weren't German, you would send your kids there. So it was uh, just a uh, kind of a pioneer because of a guy named Peter Engelman, who had kind of almost a Montessori approach to education. It was sort of hands-on. and. He, among other things, collected specimens that became a nucleus of the Milwaukee Public Museum, sort of studying from nature. So there were some interesting things going on in Milwaukee education. Uh, the public schools, that goes way back to uh, the 1840s. Milwaukee incorporates back in 1846. And public schools were part of that process. Uh, back in those days, because of the pioneer rivalries, the east and west and south sides were all fairly different settlements and remain so. Each ward was its own school district. So there was no MPS as such. <laughs> they were kind, kind of uh, rather uh, divided up, balkanized uh, in terms of, of geography. Uh, but the people of some means and people of working class as well would go to, would go to the same public schools. Uh, and recall back in those days, uh, if you got past sixth grade, you know, that, was, that was doing well you know, back in the, the later 1800s. You know, my, on the Polish side, my grand, both of my grandparents, neither one went past sixth grade, and, just, and yet ran a hardware store for, for 50 years you know, successfully. Were fish fries invented by Catholic tavern keepers trying to control the trade? <laughs> uh, another legend is that they were invented on Jones Island, uh, which was a really interesting part of town. That was a, a, a fishing colony that was dominated pe by people from the Baltic Sea coast of Poland, the Kashubs, you know, who are a rather separate subgroup. And the islanders would actually have fish fries. There were 11 saloons on Jones Island at one time. And there was actually a launch service that took people from the Wisconsin Avenue Bridge out to the island for kind of a night on the town, a walk on the wild side. Uh, there, there is no definitive history of the fish fry. There is no for sure a story of its origin. No, no one's, no one's quite sure. Where it comes from, you know, it's kind of the, the climate behind it is Milwaukee because of the Poles, the Italians, the Irish, many Germans, a very heavily Catholic city. So you couldn't eat meat on Friday until 1966, you know, when they lifted that ban. So you have the, you have the protein alternative was fish. So that was either home, and because you had such an abundant resource, being right out your front door, there was always a really plentiful supply of fish. Sold door to door, sold in the public markets. Uh, so that was, you know, part of Milwaukee's, uh, for generations, part of Milwaukee's sustenance. And the taverns, whether or not they invented it, it certainly helped to keep the guys, you know, coming in with their, their, pay, their paychecks on Friday night. And back in the day, uh, one of the, the neighborhoods in the, uh, the book is called Silver City, down around 35th and National. And that's called Silver City because it bordered the Menominee Valley, which has just a huge tens of thousands of jobs. These guys would get paid in silver coin. So on payday, Friday, you know, when the eagle screamed, the bars would just be awash in silver. So the neighborhood survives, uh, the, name, the name survives in the landscape today. Someone, someone should find you know, the, the story of the, the bay. Of, you, you can't look it up and say fish fry, you know, number first. <laughs> Doesn't work quite that way, but it certainly goes back to the, the foundations of Milwaukee. Yeah, Bart. If time and money were no object, what are the next three books? Uh, I've kind of moved a bit toward TV, and we're doing an update for the making of Milwaukee. Uh, Jones Island is something I, I would like to and probably will you know, do at least a half hour documentary on. Just a fascinating story. And Claudia Luz, uh, with whom I produced the making of Milwaukee uh, TV documentary, we're talking about maybe doing the making of Wisconsin, kind of broaden that. With, it would require some funding, uh, but that's something that uh, you know, may, uh, may be on the horizon. I want to keep working. How do you retire from something like this? It's too much fun. Yeah, Magda. Does Milwaukee have anything unique about its neighborhoods? Uh, and I would argue that every city's neighborhoods are unique. You know, Pittsburgh is not Cleveland, is not Savannah, is not Charleston. Uh, but the patterns are the same. You know, the overarching patterns are the same because of kind of the, the human need to cluster, you know, with people who know our names and speak our language and share our cultures. You'll always have these kind of uh, centrifugal forces that operate in the landscape. 
And that's always been true in Milwaukee and has been true elsewhere as well. Uh, a couple things that sort of the geographic variance in Milwaukee, it's not as, look at, look at Pittsburgh. <laughs> you know, hills, rivers, you know, you're really kind of, uh, there's some profound divisions there. Milwaukee less so, but you look at the Menominee Valley and how huge a role that has played in Milwaukee's landscape. Uh, the valley divides Milwaukee County in half. Everything south of the valley is the south side, but the north side of the valley, you've got the north side, west side, east side, and that's the Milwaukee River, kind of dividing east side from the west side. So geography has a lot to do with how people divide themselves up. Uh, but the big pattern, uh, with more time, if we do north and south sides, the big pattern both north and south these areas that were fairly unresisting geography, large areas where you didn't have natural borders, you kind of move on for miles. So the pattern was on the north side, you have for the entire history, kind of large groups kind of moving out as a unit and then being replaced by those who follow behind. The north side's case early on it was German, then it was Eastern European Jewish, and then it was African American. On the south side, the area south of Greenfield Avenue, especially north of Greenfield Avenue, Walker's Point, that area has always been crazy diverse and still is, one of the most diverse sections in Milwaukee. But south of Greenfield, again, unresisting topography, first Polish, now Latino. And you have that same broad, broad pattern going on over, over generations. Sort of sit back, it's like watching a pageant. You know, and I think that, that gives life in the city its dynamism, you know, its energy. And, History basically is the study of change, and I think the, if, you, if you don't acknowledge that, you know, you're, you're going to be just blown, blown past. I think, uh, do we have time for one more, Liz, or no? Mary? Yes, sir. No, I, I, I'm a really slow writer, and I write by... I write right by hand on a keyboard. I, I've made the transition from writing manuscript to, uh, you know, back in the 70s, late 70s, going to computer. Uh, but as a friend said, he's not sure how much he writes anymore. He just revises. Because once it's on a computer, you know, you're, you're constantly tinkering. Every time I open something up, open a file up, I'm uh, changing it in some way. But no, I, I do, it, do it the old-fashioned way you know, these days with by, by keyboard. Okay, thank you all for your attention. Books are still back and see you around town. It's a great presentation on two of the Milwaukee neighborhoods, and so you can get the book right afterwards uh, and read about all the rest of the neighborhoods. John, as you know, Rotary is an international leader in the effort to eradicate polio. In the last 30 years, we have immunized 2.5 billion kids around the world, and the disease has almost been eliminated. So we'll be making a donation in your name to the Rotary Foundation to purchase 50 doses of the vaccine to bring us closer to our goal of a polio-free world. Now, a few announcements. The scholarship committee will be meeting in room 413 following adjournment. Next week, December 1, Byron Franz, a special agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, will speak on cybercrime. And now at 11 a.m. on December 1, the Partners in Education Committee will be hearing from Latoya Sykes of Our Next Generation, and all Rotarians are invited to attend. Uh, welcome, Bill and Jean. Thank you for bringing them in. On your way out, sign up for the networking hour on December 3rd and to ring bells on December 5th. And also take a look at the beautiful photos of the Arboretum taken by Matt Flower, which are running on the uh, uh, TV screen out at the registration table. And that's it. We're adjourned. production.